Good afternoon, everyone. So, <clears throat> what is an education? What does it mean to educate? You know, I find that when I ask that question with a lot of different parents and teachers, the answer is often different depending on the person. If you ask that question to a mom who's going back to college, you'll find a very particular type of answer. If you ask a, a student that's just starting to emerge and thinking, starting to think about the world, you'll get a very different answer. If you ask an academic who's looking at particular type of cognitive outcomes and, and linking that to learning, you'll get a particular type of answer. And so, um, I'm going to offer my definition of education for the purpose of this talk, which is to broaden and deepen our understanding of the universe and ourselves in it. And um, just to use that sort of broad and deep context as a way to really explore what education is, and I encourage everyone here to keep a very open mind because we're going to be unboxing what we traditionally think about when we think about education. And if you start thinking about actually the teaching process, I'm going to look at a quote here from someone who's a lot smarter than me, which is, uh, Albert thinks that he never, he never teaches his pupils, he basically offers and provides conditions in which they can learn. Now, if we think about creating opportunity or conditions in which we learn, we can actually kind of look at the trajectory of education over generations. Now, this is my grandfather's generation, and if he was to say the conditions in which he had an opportunity to learn, he would say that for the most part, the largest portal to his understanding and his learning was formal education. He was not raised in an educated family. Um, he was not an avid reader. He grew up in a rural area that did not offer necessarily a large amount of diverse opportunities for learning. And if you look at my generation, we see the uh, introduction of early online experiences, games, and television. However, today, the generation is very different. We live in a multimodal world in a, in, with various forms of discourses. Um, we're tweeting, we're Facebooking, we're creating our own opinions, uh, we're interacting with a variety of technologies, and we're doing it uh, in all of these contexts every day, and it is a pervasive, per pervasive form of our experience. Not only are we engaging in these activities, but we have now moved into a society where the tools are cheap enough, intuitive enough, to actually create these experiences ourselves. So what we're moving now is what academics call a participatory society, where we now see kids are remixing their own media, creating their own games, and authoring their own opinions. This is happening on a global scale. I can, uh, this is happening at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a global stage. And the interesting, uh, the interesting thing to think about here is that this is such a major part of who we are and what we experience. However, the one place that we don't see this reflected is in the one place that used to be the largest opportunity for our learning. So, I've really been thinking about this problem for the past six years, and um, I've looked at different ways through outreach, research, and development that we can tackle this problem. And so, we formed a volunteer group about four years ago called Game Desk, which was really to try to apply what we know about cognition and interaction and to see if we can't make a, make a difference in, in our communities. And so we've really looked at doing this in a variety of contexts, from complete immersive environments, embodied learning, mobile devices, hard to understand sciences uh, incorporated into simulation and interaction, emotional learning, and kids actually building and making and learning through the process of making. Now, um, I'm going to walk you through some examples of what this looks like. Um, we're gonna, one, one example is constant velocity. Normally, this, uh, this concept is taught with an equation and, and, in some cases, a ramp exercise. But what better way to learn constant velocity than to move? We move. And in this particular example, students are moving and actually plotting as they move. And it's what we call attunement to the concept, attunement to the process. This is a project that's called Small Lab, developed by David Birchfield. Um, Arizona State University. And here we can see you can interact with augmented reality devices. We have titration. 
com combining H2O. And so you can see the immediate engagement. Now, one of the things that you guys might be saying is, OK, that's, that's great, Lucian, but we don't have the holodeck in our schools. Um, but you know, all you need to learn in an embodied way is your body. So I'm going to give a quick example here. I'm going to try to convey a couple of critical concepts to you around thermal energy uh, with an embodied experience. So everyone who's seen The Karate Kid, the Mr. Miyagi moment, hold up your hands. OK? And we're going to do a Mr. Miyagi here. Um, and I'm going to give you a little teleprompt of what you're actually experiencing. So here we go. One, two, three. Keep it going. Heat it up. Heat it up. All right? It's getting really hot. Now, as soon as you release, you're going to put the hot side at the bottom, and you're going to put the cold side right on top, and you're going to touch. Conduction. The shaking of molecules in your bottom hand is exciting the molecules in your top hand, and your, both, both, of your, both, of those, both your bottom and top skin is trying to reach equilibrium. You can feel the cold coming from the top and the heat coming from the bottom, can you not? So let's try it again. You ready? Here we go again. So now, when you release, you're going to hold it at the bottom, but you're not, you're going to flip your hand over on the cold side, but you're not going to touch. You're just going to try to get it as close as you can without touching. Here we go. Do you feel it? Radiation. So now, the excited molecules in our bottom hand is exciting through the air molecules and then exciting the molecules in our top hand. So we were able to very quickly, in an embodied way, get to some fundamental concepts. And you can imagine, when you do it that way, with a young mind, or with any mind, the relationship between the scientific concept and the experience is closer connected. And so, we call this motion play. We use it with the small lab system, the connect, the we, and very low-tech embodied exercises that I just demonstrated. This is a type of study. This was also done from, da from David's group. It's called a cross-experimental design. As you can see, the digital uh, embodied titration is what the, the students in one, the blue line, showing large increases in learning outcomes. The taught traditionally is the dotted line, and then they switch. So then they move the second class to the digital interaction, and then the, traditional the, uh, the digital to the traditional. And you traditionally, when you see that there is a sharp increase in outcomes associated to the particular activity, you see this type of pattern. We also see that in these types of embodied group experiences, there is an incredible increase in student-to-student -student discussion, peer discussion, articulation of what they're observing, and a, and a natural desire to want to talk about it. Another concept, aerodynamics, aeronautics, an extremely complex uh, interrelated science where there are various forces all in relationship to each other in a way that we can't see with our naked eye, um, all happening together to allow a bird to fly or a plane to fly. Now, if you were to look up aeronautics, you would probably see a diagram like this. But what if I was to say that our, our ability, our, our, our inability to completely get our head around all of these concepts and how they work is a limitation of this technology, which is the static page or the expl explanation through written text. However, if we were to take and leverage simulation and interactivity to show what you can't see and to experience these things in real time, imagine what it might be like. And so we've done that. We've created a system that allows you to actually become a bird. It's an accurate simulation of bird flight. And so you learn how to take off. You learn how to fly. We have Wiimotes hidden inside of the wings. We built this both for the iPad and for the, uh, for the, for the Wii, as well as the Kinect. <laughs> and as you can see here, you can see the lift vectors being visualized. So you begin to attune to the, how these vectors change as you begin to rotate the wings. We also show the mo molecular view of the phenomenon itself. So again, you're able to quickly attune to how these different phenomena interact. So um, if we were to continue to think about this, this is a new project we're doing with the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Sciences, where 
Geoscience and planetary science is also a scientific concept that's relatively hard to see it. Geoscience happens all around us, but we just can't see it. It happens over a long period of time. Planetary formation happens over an incredibly long period of time. But in a game, in an interaction, you can speed these things up. You can cut through the layers of the Earth. And so in this game, we're, we call it Fantasia in Space, for lack of a better title though, thus far, where you basically musically accrete your own planets. And based on the elements that you accrete and how far away you build it from the sun, you either build gas giants, hot planets, cold planets, and eventually you become a planet DJ and you, you DJ the plates and form the Alps and form volcanoes and, and form the world. And in this way, we can experience these concepts at play. The, the, the notion of the original scientist, this is something that we've really pushed because what we often find is, is that a lot of students experience, when they experience science, they often have this feeling that there was some scientist in the past who figured something out and now they don't need to figure it out anymore. They just need to read the text and understand what they did and understand the concepts. But how can you build a relationship with science? How can you build a true relationship with a scientific process if you don't build a relationship with these concepts in an original way, in, in a start, from the start? And so normally, if you think about measurement, we, and in, in this case, temperature, we think about introducing Fahrenheit, Celsius, the rationale behind these measurements, and offering the scale and showing students how to convert. However, the big thing that, we, that students need to realize right away is that these scientists created these scales because they needed to find a way in which to create an understanding of these phenomena. And really what they need to understand is that they made it up. We created measurement. Measurement did not exist. We created it. So instead of having students learn Fahrenheit and Celsius, they build their robot and they build their own scale. So the first thing they do is build degrees Susie, degrees Billy. And then, based on their own measurements, they come to a, a rationale of how effective their measurement is and how it relates to other established forms of measurement. And that creates a very different approach because you build a real relationship to the value of measurement, its need, and how to use it. And we've seen, we've seen that happen with this game. Thinking about history. So history is an amazing thing. How do civilizations form? How do they organize? How do all these interdisciplinary aspects interrelate with each other to form a society? And you know what's interesting? interesting thing about forming a civilization or modeling and creating more complex forms of interaction is it's something that we do at a very early age. Now, we do this a lot up until a certain age. You see a lot of these types of experiences. We offer these types of, ex we create these conditions for, for our children, and then something stops. Why do we stop? Why do we not continue with this process? Why do not, we not continue with something that is natural and, and expand it and integrate it into a formalized process? And so that's what we're doing. We're doing projects that help kids recreate ancient inventions from the past. We're creating opportunities through Second Life, through Minecraft, in order for them to reconstruct civilizations and create a real connection to these experiences. We also need to think about the whole person. It's not just what we learn, but it's, it's who we are. And so we've looked at building some games that actually connect to looking at emotional intelligence, um, this is an emotional management game. It's connected to your skin conductance and your pulse. The only way you can beat any of these games is to chill out. <laughs> you have the fear dojo, the frustration dojo, the anger dojo. And through this, you learn body techniques, mental techniques in which to calm your body and actually get connected to who you are and how you react to different stimuli. So it's not just about uh, playing and interacting. It's about building. So this is a very successful project where we've actually integrated common core math to remediate very low proficient students and to bring them up to their needed math skills through actually programming and designing and building their own games. And here's an example of someone in their 16th week.
So I wanted to make my grasshopper jump naturally. So I want him to know like how far and how high you're supposed to jump. For me to know how the grasshopper should jump, I have to know the quadratic formula. The first point of the parabola is the starting point. The second x is the second point of the parabola, meaning which is the vertex. And the third point of the parabola is where it lands. So by using the quadratic formula, I'm using, I can determine the vertex and which angle is jumping to. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, this is what we see in these modules. Even over short one, one week durations, we see a 20% increase in pre, post California State math scores. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the space. So uh, we started doing all these different exercises, and about two years ago, we had a conversation with the Gates Foundation, which basically asked the question, what does this look like when all of this happens in one school? How does it connect together, and what does the overall environment look like? And so we built a school that just launched six weeks ago. Um, we're very proud of it. It's called Playmaker. And it tries to integrate all of these high-tech, low-tech, and no-tech experiences that leverage play and interactivity to help kids build a better relationship to learning and a more meaningful relationship to learning. And here's a little bit of what it looks like. So learning balance and equilibrium, making. We also have kids building their own cardboard arcades and learning physics concepts through their construction. Emotional uh, management. And this is a physics sandbox game called Newton's Playground, where they're actually able to construct their own simple machines in order to solve and get introduced to physics concepts. And that's six weeks in. This is how uh, you guys might be familiar with the normal scope and sequence within a school. Um, this is how we do it. It's a completely interactive, uh, uh, choice-driven, interest-driven model. We create lots of different modules that allow a student to explore their natural interests. Now, you might think, well, that's great, but what about the stubborn teachers that are in my school? How, how do we convince them to do this type of work? This is where we take a group of teachers in the morning who come in and say, how in the heck can we do all this? And by the end, they're doing it. Here they're learning kinetic and potential energy, how to use your own body, learning simple games to, to teach grammar, aerodynamics, and dancing. <laughs> and so, and so we, we've been doing all of this great work, and we realize we're getting, you know, we're getting well funded, we're doing cool stuff, but really, what's the point? Are we going to just serve a few? Uh, pilot schools in the Los Angeles area and one school with a set group of, of kids, how can we actually scale this work? And so we were lucky enough to have met a partner last year who said, we're going to help you. And we came up with this crazy idea that we wanted to make everything we do in the school and everything we do in any school immediately transparent on a daily basis so that everybody can learn from what, from our gains from our struggles, and to actually create an open source model so that other people feel very comfortable trying these uh, alternative ways of thinking about education. And so essentially, we're building a new space that's a learning annex that's connected to this online uh, portal. And the idea is, and this we'll know for sure in March when we launch it, is that everything we learn in the school goes to this learning annex that serves the whole Los Angeles community. And everything we learn from both of these experiences serves a national portal that actually allows everybody to try them out for themselves and also gives teachers a platform to say, you know what, that was cool, but actually I didn't like that part. Here's how I did it better. And so we really think this is a, as an ignition space for generating a fantastic dialogue on rethinking education. And I invite all of you to participate. Thank you very much.